to today's talk, Jason Dexter is a postdoctoral fellow in astronomy uh, at Berkeley. His research interest is astrophysical black holes and what we can learn from the light emitted by gases falling into them. And so please join me in welcoming Jason Dexter. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, and I'm delighted to be here and glad that everybody could join us on a sunny Saturday. I'm from Seattle, so I still appreciate this um, sunshine that we have going on here. Uh, so how is the volume on this OK? Can everyone hear me well? Is it OK, great. Um, yeah, so hopefully in this talk, I'll be talking about black holes. So hopefully we're more talking about black holes out here um, than maybe in here. Um, OK, and yeah, I'll, the goal of the talk will be uh, just to get to this question of what do black holes look like and why this is actually an interesting question to ask and, and why it's actually relevant. But before I get there, um, black holes get a fair amount of press and so uh, um, and some mentions in popular culture as well. Um, so it seems as though at least movie makers feel like black holes are places that you go for a journey of some kind, maybe a family friendly fun journey into the unknown or an absolutely horrifying one. Uh, especially when your college freshman roommate insists on putting this one on at around midnight on the weekends when you're trying to go to sleep. Um, let's see, in, uh, in music, so this will be the last one of these slides, I promise. Uh, so in, in music, black holes are a little more varied, and, and hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll be able to evaluate some of these claims in these song lyrics. Um, so for, actually, Black Hole Sun is a little more plausible than, than the name might suggest. Not for our own sun, but it's possible for a black hole to sort of act like a sun. And we'll get to that. Uh, and then this uh, idea of black holes sucking things in, we'll talk to you more about this idea of black holes as vacuum cleaners. Um, cited here. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll talk about what happens to light as it falls into black holes. Luckily, it's, it's a little more interesting than just getting stripped away and turning a shade of gray. And finally, I think I'm not going to have time to get to this one at all. Um, it's not really an astrophysics question, but this is actually a very insightful lyric, um, and you can ask me more about that later, that actually, in fact, in some sense, everything is in order in a black hole. So good work, Arctic monkeys. <laughs> All right, so what I will talk about is black holes in the universe, um, and I'll start from the question of what, what actually is a black hole as predicted by, uh, by physics, by the theory of general relativity. Um, do black holes exist in the universe? And the spoiler alert, the answer to that one is yes, we believe. And, and more how do we know and what types are there and stuff like that. Um, then I'll get to this final issue of what do black holes look like and, and how do we see them in the universe and stuff like that. Okay, so the simplest uh, first argument for why there may be some object of interest of a black hole comes from this notion of the escape speed from the gravitational field of some object. Um, and so on Earth, right, this is what rockets need to obtain in order to travel outside of Earth's atmosphere and make it out into space. Um, the idea is, right, if you leave, if you just throw something up in the room, it'll do a little trajectory like this bottom one where, right, it just comes up and then goes back down. If you throw it faster, it'll keep going up higher. And then eventually, once you reach this escape speed, it'll just keep traveling out. Um, and this escape speed is given by this formula um, related to the mass of the gravitating object, so say the Earth or the Sun, maybe, and the radius um, from which you launch this object. Okay, and here are the escape speeds for the Earth and the Sun um, in, in some units. So the idea, the question that was first asked was asked sort of at the, end of the 18th, at the end of the 18th century was, what would happen if you were able to construct an object some, in some way that had an escape speed that was equal to the speed of light? Um, and why this is an interesting question is that then, right, you could picture that maybe uh, at least according to the physics at their time, light would do the same thing that, that we were talking about on the last slide, where now light would go up, and then it would reach some maximum height, and then fall back down. And that means that if you were looking at this object, which they called a dark star from a long way away, you wouldn't be able to see it, because the light would never reach you from that object. OK, and you can calculate, based on that formula on the last slide, what would the size have to be for an object of a certain mass in order to be this dark star. And it turns out, although they had multiple different pieces of physics wrong at this point in time, they actually got the exact answer right for the size of the event horizon of a black hole. Um, and this is what's known as the Schwarzschild radius, which describes how large an object would have to be to be a black hole, or how large an event horizon is for an object of a certain size. Um, and the answer is that for the mass of the Earth, it would have to be an inch, and for the Sun, two miles. So we're not very close to being a black hole here on Earth. 
Um, and, and the other way to think about this, right, is that the escape speed from the surface of the Earth is nowhere near the speed of light. It's much slower than that. OK, so this idea wasn't really returned to for a long time. Um, after this, and, and the main reason was that they had multiple different pieces of physics wrong that led them to think that maybe a dark star was something that was possible. So this really wasn't revisited until uh, Einstein came along with the general theory of relativity in 1915. Um, and, and one of the first solutions to Einstein's equations of general relativity were the, was the solution for what uh, space looks like in the vicinity of a black hole. And this is, was devised by Carl Schwarzschild shortly before he died in World War I. Um, and is known as the Schwarzschild metric, and this is why we call the size of an event horizon the Schwarzschild radius in honor of him. Okay, so what is this solution? Um, this is actually the uh, black holes are, it turns out, according to general relativity, are the simplest solution of uh, exact solution of a physical object that we know of, um, at least in classical physics, of a macroscopic object. Okay, black holes are completely described as having just a certain amount of mass, which is all concentrated at the center and an event horizon, uh, and, and they can also spin around, but we won't really go into that in detail. But those are the only things that they can do and have electric charge, I guess. But there are only a few things that black holes can possibly do. Um, and the most important feature of black holes is that they have an event horizon, which is just this region in space at which the escape speed is equal to the speed of light. And that means that for astronomers or astrophysicists, we can never know what goes on in here. Um, so according to, the, according to general relativity, all the mass is down here, but it doesn't really matter. This surface, the event horizon, might as well be the size of the black hole itself because we can never see inside of it. Okay, and this, and this issue of all the mass being at the center um, should make you a little bit uneasy. Uh, at least it does for physicists since normally uh, this means that a black hole has a finite mass in zero volume, um, and that means that the density is infinite. And usually, when physicists come across infinities in their calculations, right, they go back and look for the mistake in their algebra um, or the bug in their computer code or whatever to try to figure out what went wrong. Uh, and you can ask me more about this later. I'm not, I'm not really going to get into it since for astrophysicists, right, the black hole really ends here. But it, it's basically a statement that general relativity probably doesn't describe what happens um, when you get down to very small scales at the center of a black hole. OK, and another cool thing about black holes that's going to be relevant for this talk is that there's an area outside the event horizon where light can actually orbit around in circles. And sorry, yeah, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. Yeah, well, I was just going to ask about when you say Schwarzschild radius, and it looked like there's two links there. And what's this ergo sphere? OK, yeah, so this, so, so this Schwarzschild radius strictly only applies to a black hole that's not spinning. So black holes can have a mass, a spin, and a charge. Normally, in, in astronomy, we don't care about the charge because um, electric forces are very strong. So we don't expect black holes in the universe to be able to acquire any net charge because if they do, then some other charged object will just come in and neutralize it. Um, but the spin, we don't know anything about. So this is actually a diagram of a spinning black hole. Um, and spinning black holes are a little bit different. So the size of the event horizon is not given by the Schwarzschild radius exactly. It's, that's only for when the spin's zero. Um, and then this, yeah, this ergosphere uh, is a region in which it's possible to extract energy from a black hole. Um, and this, it's basically the, the surface inside of which, if a black hole's spinning, if, if an object cannot be at rest inside the surface, it has to acquire some of the spin of the black hole. And there's a way that you can actually tap into that energy. OK, and yeah, if you want to, we can talk more at the end about that. Uh, but anyway, there's, there's this, for all black holes, regardless of their spin, there's this region where light can actually go in circles. Oh, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, a while back, you talked about the one inch over the Earth. What was that? What was that measuring? Oh, that's if you wanted to have a black hole with the mass of the Earth. It would, its event horizon would be an inch. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's this region outside of black holes where light can actually go in circles, and this is um, sort of analogous to how satellites right, can orbit the Earth or something like that. Um, it turns out that, that light does bend in the presence of black holes, and in fact, um, at some place, you can have it go in circles, although not, not forever for a finite amount of time. It's not a stable orbit, um, and, and this will be important later for what we expect black holes to look like. OK, so before we go on, uh, we're going to have a quiz. So please discuss with some people next to you, nearby. Uh, come up with some answers to the following questions about black holes. Um, so the first question is, what would happen to Earth's orbit if we suddenly replaced the sun with a black hole of the same mass? What would happen to the Earth? Um, the second one is, 
If heaven forbid you fell through an event horizon into a black hole, what would it look like to you, assuming that you didn't get torn up or anything, and that's that's actually quite possible for a big black hole? Um, then what what would this experience of falling through an event horizon be like? And thirdly, what would you see if you watched something else fall into a black hole from a long way away? What would that appear to do to you? So take a couple minutes, uh, discuss with your neighbors, come up with some answers, and then we'll go over these questions. Give you a couple minutes. You had a chance to come to some conclusions on these. So who wants to take a crack at number one? What would happen if we suddenly replaced the sun with a black hole of the same mass? Sure. Well, uh, nothing because it Earth's orbit, but of course everything would get cold. What do other people think? Do you guys agree? That nothing. You ventured that nothing would happen. Okay. And that is in fact true. Uh, so the, the key point here is that um, this gets back to this black hole sucking things in or this general perception of black holes being sort of vacuum cleaners in the universe. Black holes in fact don't gravitate any more than you do or I do or the Earth does or the Sun does. Um, they, for any other object of the same mass, if you're far away from a black hole, its gravity will feel exactly like anything else. Um, where far away here is compared to many times the Schwarzschild radius, roughly, which is very small, right? So for the sun, that was a couple miles. We're a lot further away from the sun than a couple miles, so nothing actually will happen. Except, yeah, it'll, it'll get cold. Yeah. Eight, eight minutes, so. Okay, so what about the second one? What's, what's it gonna feel like if, uh, what's it gonna feel like if you fall into a black hole? What's that event rising gonna feel like? Yeah. You wouldn't notice. Uh, and why is that? Right, yeah, so this, this is the idea that, so event horizons are actually empty space. There's nothing located at an event horizon. Um, it's the point in space at which uh, light can no longer es escape the black hole, so we can't see any signals from outside, but in fact, for you falling through an event horizon, right, provided that you're able to stay intact, um, probably feel some mild discomfort for most sizes of black holes, but, uh, but, but you will not actually be able to tell. Oh, should put the dancer. Um, and this is, right, event horizons are empty space. There's no actual surface there. For someone falling in, yeah. If, if there's no light that can emanate from the event horizon on your, when you're outside it, and then you cross into it, don't you then see all the light that could emanate out? So you, the whole way falling in, have a certain amount of region of space from which you can see light, um, and this is. So you, uh, so to you locally, you won't notice anything special happen as you cross. Does that, does that help at all? So it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit tricky, but there's nothing, there's nothing, I guess, that's sort of floating around inside the event horizon that you suddenly get to see. How about that? Because I have this image of the light, say, going up and then coming back down again because it can't get out. And so when you're on the outside of that, you can't see that light, and suddenly you're on the other side, and now you can see all the light. Right. This is, this is probably my fault. It should be more clear. So this idea of light coming up and going back down was the 18th century... Right, this is not what we think the interior of the black hole looks like. Right, this, in fact, you can, you can calculate what happens to things when they go inside black holes, light or otherwise, inside the event horizon. And, I mean, it's a little bleak. In, you know, a finite amount of time, they, they reach basically the center of the black hole, and that's that, so. Yeah. yeah. Would you still see, if you were looking backwards, would you still see light coming in from outside? If you were still looking in backwards. See light. Yes, I mean, you could see other things that are crossing the event horizon to you. And in fact, so if you're right outside the black hole is really where it would be rather spectacular, probably, because you could see there's these images of, you know, for instance, what would the galaxy look like from right next to a black hole? And it's pretty spectacular because you get a lot of light gets bent. So you can effectively see sort of 360 degrees or something, right? It'd be a pretty, it'd be a pretty picture. Uh, not yet. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly, but on the scale of a kiloparsec, so it's, that's what, I don't know, thousands of light years. It's not, not too close. Um, but there, there probably are ones closer, we just don't know where they are exactly. All right, let's move on to this third one. Actually, a question 
Oh, uh, so wouldn't you see the photosphere, like, if there's other objects coming in, they're just, you know, really light is bouncing around? If there are other things falling into the black hole with you, yes, you'll be able to see them. But you would see the photosphere radius. Uh, yeah, so this is, if you're outside the event horizon, right, you could see some spectacular stuff partially because of this circular photon orbit. And because of the lights being bent, right, you, you feel, you'll be able to see a lot more than you normally would, right? So you can, instant, for instance, see behind your head, or, I mean, not really, but behind the black hole behind your head. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay, and now if you watched something or someone else fall into a black hole, what would, what would happen? Yeah, you wouldn't see anything happen. Because the light can't escape. Um, yeah, so, so as it falls in, so say before this thing passes the event horizon, would, would anything, it would, just, would it just fall in as with anything else? What would happen? Yeah, um, since it's accelerating to the speed of light, wouldn't it just get redder and redder so you could see it? So in fact it will, it will get redder and redder. So this is uh, um, not strictly because it's reaching the speed of light, but because basically the light that's reaching you is coming from a deeper and deeper gravitational well, you can think of it. So this light is actually losing energy as it climbs out to reach you. And this is what's known as a gravitational redshift. So the light, the wavelength of the light, if you like, is getting stretched out more and more, and that'll make it appear redder and redder. So that's definitely one thing that will happen um, as, yeah, as you fall in. Yeah. The objects will be stretched out, elongated. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's definitely true, at least for certain types of falling in. Yeah, so what will, what will it appear to do? Will it, will it fall in at the same speed as other things? It'll slow down. Why is that? Because it's taking the light longer and longer to reach you. Yeah, that's right. So it's actually effectively the light is traversing more and more distance as it's, and this sort of works if you think of this as a big well or something, that just to go some horizontal distance then you're climbing out to or something. But, but either way, yes, effectively the light is traveling um, for a lot longer. Uh, and so, right. So to put it all together, I think uh, if you watch something fall in, it'll appear to slow down. As it approaches, because light's taking longer to reach you, it will never pass through, as, as was mentioned, it'll never pass, appear to pass through the event horizon because the light from in there can't reach you. So you'll never see something fall through an event horizon. It'll just sort of slow down and then freeze at the surface. Um, and, and it'll also, at the same time, uh, quickly fade until no longer visible. And this is, so the first name for a black hole that stuck until the 1960s was a frozen star. And the idea was this first part here that basically you'll see all objects that fall in tend to freeze at the surface. And so they thought maybe it'll just look kind of like a star that's you know, frozen in time. Um, but they were neglecting this gravitational redshift part that at the same time as it's doing this, the light is also being stretched out. And so very quickly, it just fades to nothing. And so this is black hole is really the more um, accurate term to come up with later. OK, great. Good job, everybody. OK, so now that we have black holes, um, we have a, a physics idea of what a black hole might be. Um, how could we imagine forming these in the universe? Are these, are these objects that are just right, nice things for theoretical physics, or, or are they relevant to, to our own universe? Um, and, and so how, how could we possibly get something to collapse down to a black hole is basically the, the question. And really, the way to think about it, I think, is why doesn't everything collapse down to a black hole? Um, so gravity is always trying to collapse everything. Um, all of us, the Earth, everything into a black hole, and it's only that we're that we're able to resist this um, collapse is is really the way to think about it. And in particular, in the case of stars, um, stars generate energy by nuclear reactions, which then right heats the star up, and that lets it sort of the stuff in the star is sort of bouncing around and colliding, and that effectively this pressure produced by the stuff bouncing around in the star supports it against gravity. Um, and, and so this is how like the sun right, is burning hydrogen in its center, which releases enough energy to effectively hold it up um, against gravity. And that, that then raises the question of what happens if under some circumstances, oh, sorry, yeah. Could there be a, a, a black hole, a small black hole in the center of the sun? Would we know it? No, we wouldn't know. So, this is, so I guess this, this whole issue of uh, black holes don't gravitate better than other things also is, is one of the issues with this, uh, Thing that was raised about maybe the accelerator in CERN will create black holes and swallow the Earth or something. So one, there, there are many problems, but one problem is that if you were able to create, right, this would be a very, very small black hole that they could create. They're bouncing particles around. So it wouldn't, gravi gravity is very weak. This thing wouldn't 
grow at all, right? Okay, so there, there are other issues, but that's one. And that's the same thing with, right, there could be tons of little black holes in the room. You wouldn't, I don't know, I doubt it, yeah, right? There, there are other theories that say that small black holes shouldn't survive, so don't take that too seriously, but you wouldn't know it. Yeah, to answer your question. Okay, but so this, so, so stars commonly are uh, having nuclear reactions which generate energy which uh, support them against gravity and halt their collapse, which raises the question of what happens if either a star is too heavy so that its self-gravity is too strong, or what happens uh, when it runs out of fuel and can no longer generate energy to stave off its collapse. Okay, and, and at least until about 1930, what was thought is that all stars will sort of die peacefully, that they'll become um, that they'll basically shed their outer layers and become what are known as white dwarf stars, which are, they don't generate any energy by nuclear reactions, but instead are supported just by the quantum mechanical fact that electrons don't like to be near each other. Um, and that produces some just um, ambient pressure, and basically that means that there's kind of a maximum amount that you can compress down a certain amount of, uh, of electrons before they just start to support themselves, just due to this just due to quantum mechanics. And so every, everyone thought that this is what would happen to all stars, and this is what we think will happen to the sun, for instance. Um, but then uh, a guy named Chandrasekhar took a boat ride from India uh, to the UK to study with, with Eddington. Um, and on this boat ride, he was working out some structure for white dwarf stars in quantum mechanics, as many of us like to do in our free time. Uh, and he had a lot of time to kill. And by the time he arrived, he'd, he'd arrived at a very startling conclusion that nobody really saw coming, which is that if you just try to figure out these, just take this idea of uh, quantum mechanics with electrons and just construct structures of these electrons, it turns out that there's a maximum mass of these things that you can actually have just sit there stably and not um, and, and exist. And this limit is now known as the Chandrasekhar limit. It's about a little under one and a half times um, the mass of our sun is the maximum mass for a white dwarf. And then Chandrasekhar was really ostracized for this conclusion, um, especially by his own advisor. Eddington really didn't like this. And it led to Chandrasekhar actually leaving this field of white dwarfs and doing other things. And he had an incredible 50-year career, after which he got the Nobel Prize eventually for this um, finding. And actually, the last topic that he worked on was on black holes. And he wrote an awesome, uh, very mathematical book on black holes. Um, and, and so then, right, this means if a star starts out massive enough such that it can't lose enough mass to get under this limit, then it can't become a white dwarf when it runs out of fuel. And now we need to know what else will happen to it. Um, and, and so the next thing is, well, if it keeps collapsing, then at some point, and, and this is only sort of roughly true, uh, the neutrons in the, in the star will sort of act like the electrons were before. Neutrons are the same fermions, same type of particles as electrons. They don't like to be near each other. Um, they're more massive, so they generate more of this so-called degeneracy pressure um, and, and can sort of uh, support, support things at smaller radius. So you'll collapse more and form a neutron star. Um, and a lot of calculations of this kind of stellar collapse were done by Oppenheimer, who's at Berkeley, um, and his group. And, and they found the important conclusion that just like in the white dwarf case, there's also a limit that exists for neutron stars, that above about twice the mass of the sun, even uh, even this, this neutron star state cannot exist. And after this, we don't know of anything else that can support any stars. So if you can't get down to this roughly two by, say, blowing up in a supernova or doing whatever, doing whatever the star can do, then we don't know of any other final state that something can reach other than a black hole. What does T-O-P stand for? Oh, yeah. Uh, crap, I forgot to remember the T name. Uh, these are the three people that, that discovered this limit for neutron stars in Oppenheimer's group. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned um, white dwarfs. Uh, they're no longer <coughs> generating any energy from fusion. Uh, so how do we see them? So, so that's right. So, so uh, we see white dwarfs in a couple of ways. So if they're young, then they're cooling, and we can still see them when they're young. Just they have residual energy left over. Um, just from being hot as stars for a long time. So we see them as they cool. And the other way that we see them is when they are in uh, binary systems, then they can strip mass off of their companions. And then they'll, the, when that mass reaches the surface, right, then it'll start igniting nuclear reactions. So we can see surface burning on white dwarfs as well. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised when you said that like the electrons and neutrons didn't like to sit next to each other. Like, don't they sit next to each other in the nuclei?
Yeah, and they don't, and they aren't particularly happy about it. <laughs> What's that? Well, it's it's the there's the there's also competing forces. So there's the strong force that holds together the nuclei, and overcomes this. But this is one that's that particular thing. The neutrons don't like to be next to each other. Enters into when you calculate, say, the structure of nuclei, what nuclei can exist stably and stuff like that. Um, you have to take into account this fact that neutrons don't like to be next to each other. I'm not sure I'm seeing this. Oh, in the image, I think that's just the lighting on his, on his, are you talking about here? <laughs> I see. I don't, I don't believe that's a mustache. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Okay, so now, uh, so, so World War II sort of interrupted what the Oppenheimer group was doing, but, but um, later in the 60s and 70s, for basically, because of astronomy, people returned to black holes um, and, and learned quite a bit. And this is our current... Uh, crudely, our current understanding of what happens at the end of stars. So for low-ish mass stars, sort of, I don't know, 8 to 10 times the mass of the sun, they'll be able to reach this white dwarf state where they'll, um, they'll manage to shed a lot of their outer layers and, and become white dwarfs later. Um, and right, some, these don't, the, the old view is that these peacefully sit there forever um, in, in the universe, but actually we know now that a lot of these blow up as type 1a supernovae, right, which is what won the Nobel Prize in physics this last year. Um, for its role in cosmology. For more massive stars, then uh, if it can blow up as a supernova, then it can become a neutron star. Um, as long as it can right, get rid of all the other mass other than the one and a half to two, that they can remain as a neutron star. And above either, if it can't do that, if it can't have a successful supernova that blows off almost all the mass, or if it just starts out too massive to do that, um, then, then we believe it just has to become a black hole. OK, and so this is one of the types of of black holes that we think we see in the universe. So not only do we think that these should form from stellar collapse, but we see things that, that we think are these black holes. Um, and the way that we see them is that we see objects in binaries, and we can weigh their masses from the orbit of the binary. So this is a, a black hole or something in orbit with a regular star. And from weighing this, we figure out that the other object is too big to be anything else. It's above the maximum. It's compact, right? It's not a star. It's above the maximum size for a white dwarf, and it's above the maximum size for a neutron star. And these things tend to be about 6 to 10 or 14 or something times the mass of the sun. And, and although we've only found, I don't know, some number, tens of these things um, in, in our own and very close by galaxies, we think that there are probably millions of these in every galaxy. Um, and these are the result of this stellar collapse. We also, and this is very surprising, uh, this is very surprising to everyone, see enormous black holes. Uh, at the center of every galaxy, we think, there's a huge millions to billions times the mass of the sun black hole sitting at the center. Um, the formation, how these things came to be, is not totally understood. So you might imagine that maybe they start out as these guys, and then just over the course of the history of the universe, they grow from swallowing matter from their surroundings. Um, but now we're starting to see these huge ones even very, at very high redshift, so very far back in time in the universe. And it's unclear if they really had time to form uh, to get to their current size, uh, to get to the size of the time we see them, starting from these little guys. So maybe basically at the beginning of the universe, we were much better at forming huge um, black holes uh, initially than we, than we think we are now. And this is, this is an, open, an open area of research. And, and so, so this, is where this, right, this is where the vacuum cleaner idea comes from. It's not that black holes gravitate better than anything else. It's that we have some black holes that are enormous. <laughs> So if, if anything else could reach this size, it would also be a cosmic vacuum cleaner or something. Yeah? Why do you think that there are millions of galaxies that have So you can estimate the rate based on, we know that we can very rarely actually see them um, because we need to have something going around in a binary and we need to be able to measure its properties well enough to figure out right, that, that this is its mass and that it can't be anything else. Um, and so you can try to, it, it's a, it's very much an estimate, but you can, from that knowledge of how limited you are at observing these, you can try to guess how many there should be everywhere, just assuming that right, they should be randomly distributed across various things. So, yeah. so we know that Sagittarius A is a black hole at the center of our galaxy. Do we know of any other black holes in our galaxy? Yeah, we know. Of, so most of these guys are in our galaxy. And, and we've observed them. What do you mean? So we'll get back to this question of what it means to observe them. 
Um, so we've observed, observed them in this way. We've measured an object in a binary with a star that's too big to be anything else. Uh, and then, so the other really cool thing that was unanticipated about this having huge uh, black holes at the center of galaxies is that it turns out that these black holes and the whole galaxy know something about each other, which is somewhat surprising because the gravity of the black hole is, is a lot. It's a big black hole, but it's, not, it's nothing compared to the gravity of the galaxy itself. Um, and, and so this suggests that there's some uh, interesting relationship between basically how a black hole grows from being from its initial size up to being millions to billions times the mass of the sun and how the galaxy itself forms. And this is very much also an active area of research. Okay, and so, so I've said a little bit about how we figure out that there are small black holes. I mean, it kind of makes sense. So we think that stars collapse, right, and these, these become small black holes. But how do we get these, how do we think that there are these huge ones? Since we have no way to really form them directly, and maybe we're just wrong, right? So what is the evidence that these actually exist? And it turns out that, as just alluded to, the best evidence for the existence of one of these massive black holes, millions of times the mass of the sun, exists in the center of our own Milky Way. Um, and the center of our own Milky Way is a busy place. There's a lot of stars and stuff in, right in the center. And if you zoom in in the infrared, um, you can make out lots, lots of stars. And kind of surprisingly, there are lots of young stars that somehow formed right in the center of the galaxy. Um, and if you zoom in even more on this image, then you can see the spectacular results come up with by two groups, one at UCLA and one in Germany, where they've, over the last 15 to 20 years or so, have now mapped out orbits of individual stars in the very center of the galaxy. And if you look at this a couple of times, you'll be able to see that these stars are clearly orbiting an unseen point here. Um, and some of them are, have rather spectacular orbits. So for instance, this yellow one reaches a speed of 4% of the speed of light as it does this little, you'll see it do a little slingshot uh, down, down here at the bottom. And you can, from just modeling these stars, you can figure out basically to have, this, to have these stars do these things, what, how much mass do we need to have at this little location generated by the star? And it turns out that it's 4 million times the mass of the sun. And because we can resolve down to such small scales, uh, we, we know that this mass has to be contained in a tiny little volume down here. And there's nothing else that we know of that exists in the universe that can fit in that tiny spot except for a black hole. Okay, and that's really the strongest evidence is saying what else could it be and eliminating everything else. Okay. So, this, so these examples of in binaries and in the center of the galaxy, all these things about evidence for black holes are from their gravity. We're seeing them by their gravitational effects on other things like stars. Um, but uh, but can we see light from black holes themselves, right? That would be a cool, uh, stuff is falling into black holes all the time. Can we see it? Um, so if we have a black hole that's just sitting alone in the universe, um, here is what it looks like. So uh, luckily for us, most, a lot of black holes, at least a lot, are not sitting alone, right? So as I said, things are falling into them all the time, or maybe they're in binaries and stripping off material from some star or something. Um, and this is, this is how we can see light from black holes themselves, is the light from things that fall into them. And it turns out that even though the black hole itself emits no light, um, it's, a, it's a tremendous engine for generating both light and energy. And, and in fact, it turns out that black holes are, are sort of the most powerful engines we know of in the universe. They power the brightest objects in the universe that we see, um, and they're very good at producing light. So we see spectacular things like uh, this is a galaxy where a black hole is driving stuff out that we see along these axes. And we can see these on sort of galactic scale jets, ultra relativistic jets of energy and uh, light um, on, on sort of across, spanning across the entire galaxy, even though the black hole itself is much, much smaller than that tiny little dot at the center. OK, so in this, in this way, I would say, uh, I would argue that maybe the actual black holes that we observe in the universe are, are more spectacular than in pop culture. Right? This is actually. Pretty cool. These these things are uh, tremendous engines for for generating spectacular How phenomena. Is that energy generated? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so so in this case, what we think is happening, and I'll show a movie in a second, is that as stuff falls in, it kind of stuff tends to be orbiting in some way. It doesn't shoot directly into a black hole, so it'll tend to form a disk around it as it as it gets closer, um, and then and then some of that stuff will then get channeled out the other direction. So perpendicular to how it's coming in, in this disk, you'll be able to sort of shoot things out in these two directions. And this may have to do with the fact that the black hole itself has spin um, related to this ergosphere idea that you can extract energy from the black hole itself. Or it may just have to do with 
um, extracting energy from the stuff as it falls in? That's an open question. Yeah, so these are different, um, these are different just uh, energy of light that we're seeing. It's totally false color. None of this is visible light. Uh, those X2 galaxies? What's that? X2 galaxies. No, it's just one galaxy. What's that one? Star? Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is a star. No, this is just an artist's conception. Oh, what? Is that two galaxies? No, this is just one galaxy and different stuff. So here we have some uh, diffuse galaxy stuff, and then we have this is a radio galaxy, so this is a radio jet of stuff being shot out from a black hole. This one is not a thing. It's the one on the top. The one on the top. There's two, two orange blobs. The orange blobs are the, are the stuff that's shot out from the black hole, and then okay. that stuff is, is ramming into ambient stuff out in the galaxy and then lighting up. It's called a radio galaxy. Yes, 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 as far as I know, yes. All right, so here's quickly just a movie um, that one of my collaborators did trying to calculate what, what does a black hole, what does stuff that falls into a black hole look like? Uh -huh. There we go. Okay, so, so what he does, you start, you just put some gas around a black hole. Um, let's keep going. Is it going? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah it looks like it's going too. Yeah. All right, it says it's going, but it's not flying. Well, we might have to skip this. I'll try one more time. Oh no, it's it's not. It's it's things should have happened by now. Well, let's try one more time. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to have to give up on that one. Well, I promise it actually does something. So it's, like, it's a little more interesting than this. Yeah, this stuff, so this is gas that starts out around the black hole. You just put it there, um, and then you let it. It starts to fall in. I um, mean, in this particular calculation, it does, in fact, shoot stuff out um, along here. Not material, but energy and maybe light. It's all right. I can, if anyone's very interested, I can show you at the end. It's not going to fight with it longer. OK. Um, and so, uh, so as I said, so we have, we can see black holes with light itself, as well as with just gravity. Um, and as I've said, the evidence right now that black holes exist is just from uh, kind of indirect measurements of, of saying, finding things that have a certain mass and a certain volume and saying, we don't know of anything else that they could possibly be other than a black hole, so it must be a black hole. But now that we have light from the black hole itself, you might wonder, can we do any better, right? Can we, is there any signature that you might expect from light very close to an event horizon that would tell you this is a black hole for sure? Um, and it turns out the answer is, is yes. Um, and again, the best prospects for this, for actually imaging, taking a picture in a sense of an event horizon, is in the center of our own galaxy in the Milky Way again. And this is because our galactic center black hole, 4 million times the mass of the sun, is very close to us. So it's the biggest one on the sky, the biggest event horizon on the sky. It's not big, it's very small. Uh, it's several micro arc seconds, which is something like trying to look for a baby penguin on the moon. Um, this baby penguin is not on the moon, as far as I know. <laughs> And the way that you try to do this is you use radio telescopes all over the Earth together um, and form them together into a gigantic array. And basically, having very widely separated telescopes gives you, gives you very high resolution at trying to look for, for the black hole at the center of our galaxy. And this project that's ongoing now is called the Event Horizon Telescope, um, trying to image an event horizon. And the important question, right, then, is what do we expect to see? What does gas falling through an event horizon look like? Okay, and in the last few minutes, I'll try to address that question. Yeah. Can you give us some sense of how big the event horizon on the black hole at the center of the galaxy is, like as big as our solar system? Or is it like uh, yeah, it's, so it's 10 to the 12 centimeters. Um, is that a useful unit? AU centimeters? Somebody? It's smaller than an AU, but it's maybe a tenth, a hundredth, I'm just guessing. Something like that. 
Maybe a tenth. That's my guess. Small. Uh, well, for its distance, right? It's pretty big, actually. <laughs> OK, so the first most important effect for what we expect a uh, black hole to look like, if you're able to take a picture of its event horizon, is the black hole should cast a shadow. Um, and the, the reason for this is because light goes in a circle around black holes. So the idea is that basically, uh, if you're trying to look, say, from this direction, then any light that gets emitted between this photon sphere and the black hole itself will tend to be strongly bent back around, basically. So it'll either get captured by the black hole, or it'll go out this way but you won't, you won't see it looking from this direction. Whereas stuff from out here and out here and out here, you'll tend to see a lot more easily. So if you look at what the image of what this would look like, if you look from over here, say, then it might look like this, um, where you have basically a big black circle in the middle that's dimmer. It's not zero, but it's much dimmer than the stuff outside of it because most of the light that sort of corresponds to pixels in here gets swallowed by the black hole or goes backwards. Um, and similarly, you, this one doesn't really have it, but you also might expect there to be a bright ring corresponding to this, to this location, just because light here is going around in circles, so there's a lot of different light that can sort of go on these paths around in circles and reach you. Why does it look flattened than the left? Why does it look what? Flattened than the left. Oh, yeah, so this is for a spinning black hole. Um, and that means that you have basically, when you're looking, uh, light orbits a spinning black hole differently, depending on whether it's going with the spin or against the spin. So here it was coming with the spin, and that means that this photon sphere is, is shifted in size. It moves in on, on one. So there are basically two of these photon spheres, depending on which way you're orbiting, with or against the spin. So on this side, you're coming from the photon sphere that's going with the spin, and on this side, you're going from against the spin. Yeah? Gravitational lens of Yeah, so this is, this is sort of a ultimately strong gravitational lensing, if you like. Uh, normally, when people refer to gravitational lensing, they're not talking about from right around the event horizon, right? They're talking about like small deflections or things like that. Or... So would that further light be fed in and remove the shadow effect? Oh, no, no. So this, this is sort of included. So we'll get to the effects of lensing or light bending. Or, I mean, this is one, but we'll get to the others in a second. But no, they don't, no, they don't um, change this. OK, so another, the other sort of most important effect uh, is that as material falls into the, to the black hole, it starts to go close to the speed of light. So as I said, that star is going at sort of 4% of the speed of light when it gets closest, and it's not even that close to the event horizon. So as things get clo gets closer, they go very close to, the, to that speed. Um, and, and when you have this happen with sound or light or anything where you approach right, moving sources that are going almost at the speed of the waves themselves, then they start, the waves start to effectively pile up in the direction of motion. Okay, so this is just uniformly from something at rest. What does it look like as it spreads out waves? So this is light in our example. Um, and, and in this case, when you're moving along this way, the light tends to pile up in this direction of motion. And that will make both that changes the pitch of, say, sound or something, or the color of light, because the spacing now, the wavelength, is effectively smaller in this direction and longer in this direction. And it'll also make it brighter, just because this stuff piles up. Um, and you may be familiar with this now that I moved to San Francisco. I'm noticing this a lot with ambulance sirens. Um, but, but you may be familiar with this car horns, ambulance sirens for sound. Right? And in the extreme case where this thing goes faster than, say, the speed of sound, this is how you would get a sonic boom, is that this thing would be leading the waves. Right? OK, so if we put that in, now we have things that are orbiting. So now we have gas that's orbiting into and out of this screen. So it's coming towards you over here and away from you over here, and it'll be brighter on this side. And here's our, we've changed scales. We'll keep changing scales and colors as we go through these next ones, so sorry about that. Um, but this is our shadow here, and this is our bright spot from gas that's coming towards us and emitting light that's piling up and going away from us, and light that's piling up pointed into the screen, so not towards that. OK, and our next, so our next important effect is that light, so we've sort of done this with the shadow, that light bends near black holes, but this is really the gravitational lensing one. Um, that if you have, so, and the simplest example is just if you take sort of a uniform screen, I don't know how you can see this, a uniform screen, say a camera, and then just project it around a black hole, then it'll, then it'll get bent. So this is kind of, it'll get mildly distorted if the black hole is not spinning and you're looking, so, or you're looking straight down on a spinning one. If it's spinning, then it'll tend to do this where the grid itself will actually get dragged around with the spin of the black hole. Um, this, is, right, this is frame dragging. 
Uh, and, and then if you're inclined, so if you're looking at an angle down towards the black hole at an angle to how it's spinning, um, or, or just to an angle to where you put the screen, then it'll tend to get lens. So it'll get focused in the back, at the back of the black hole. And if you combine those, then you can get some mixture of these effects of gravitational lensing and frame dragging. OK, and, th and this is important because uh, that last calculation was sort of a spherical cloud of gas falling in, but we really expect it might look a little more like a disk. Um, and so this is what happens if you have the Doppler effect. You still have the shadow in here. You're brighter on this side, but now you have just a disk of material, right? So if this had no general relativity, this would just, this part would be blocked by the black hole, right? And then you would just see this as a disk here. But instead, what you see is very different, that this part behind the black hole appears to be bent up over it. I mean, that's just because light gets bent around the black hole to you and appears to come from above. And, and if you did this with sort of a finite disk, it would also tend to come from below. Right? So this is light getting bent up above and around the black hole to you or uh, below and around the black hole to you. <coughs> All right, and the final thing is that you expect that this is probably not, we'll see if this one works any better than the last one. Um, the, the, the gas is probably not just sitting there um, around the black hole, it's probably rotating. So what happens if we take a blob? Oh, no. Well, all right, I got to try to get this one. I'm supposed to be able to watch pretty, pretty movies. So let's see, does it work here? We may have to do the static version of what does the black hole look like today. I guess I could try quitting PowerPoint. Otherwise, I'm sure it'll work as soon as uh, we stop and I just have the laptop again. So if you want to come watch it, then um, you're welcome to. Static version is still pretty. It just doesn't, it just doesn't move around all nicely. All Everybody fingers crossed. Yeah, whatever you have to do. Oh, here we go. Sorry, sometimes it appears one place and sometimes we all right, there we go. Moving, moving blob. All right, so now we've got a blob in motion. This one's getting a little bit complicated because we're kind of combining a lot of different effects. And so we'll go through it a couple times. So basically, up here is the image of a blob without general relativity, and down here is with general relativity, um, and this, this one combines a lot of these different effects. So we'll start out looking down on the thing orbiting, um, and it'll be a little weird. So there's this extra image, which is from light that goes around in a circle and then comes to you, so that the blob is effectively in a different location by the time you see that. Um, this one's the main blob. And then as we start to incline, you see strong Doppler beaming, where this side is much brighter, and you get this cool gravitational lensing where it tends to form a, a ring around uh, here. All right. Sure, you want to do the get? Let's do this next one first, and then we can go back. All right. So now if we put it all together, so this was the movie from before that was supposed to have worked. So I guess, I guess it would be a natural time to go back. Um, so we'll go back and try to watch this one without general relativity and then with. So yeah, so here we've put a bunch of gas around a black hole, um, and then we let it fall in. We put magnetic fields in it so that it becomes unstable and starts to all fall into the black hole and accrete. Um, and now you form this nice little disk in here of stuff that's feeding the black hole, and you get these are magnetic field lines just showing that you're, you're shooting out a huge amount of electromagnetic energy um, along this pole here. 
This is from my collaborator, Jonathan McKinney, who's now at Maryland. And that'll keep going for a while. So now let's look at that one, putting together the, uh, what you would see from it. Um, Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> I swear my computer is normally very stable, but we're struggling. Shouldn't have gone back. <laughs> Always forward. Gotta keep going. Okay, I swear we're just about done. Oh no, we're not even on the. Oh no. This is going to work perfectly. Remember this talk? It's a pretty good talk. There we go. Okay, we're gonna do the same thing here. We're putting it all together, but from that movie rather than just a single blob. Now we have lots of blobs, we have lots of gas. It's doing all that crazy stuff from the movie, and we're gonna look at it as it would appear to us um, on the Earth. So we'll start out looking. This is now rotating right into and out of the projector, and then we'll rotate the viewing angle. So we'll basically see here it's strongly Doppler beam because the stuff is coming right at us, so the waves are very piled up on this side and very piled up the wrong way on this side. So it's very dim over here and very bright over here. We can now see the back of the black hole here and here being bent up above and bent down below. Um, and then as, especially as we go, oh no, I lost my mouse. Especially as we go to uh, looking straight down on it, you'll see very prominently this shadow. Okay, and this grid sort of shows how we're looking at things. So here we're very asymmetric from this Doppler effect and now you can start to see there's actually a bright ring here that kind of stays put. That's the photon sphere that you can see. And then as we get to close to face on to looking down on the, on the gas, then you can really see this black hole shadow in the middle here. Okay, and this is sort of my best guess for what, for what this Event Horizon Telescope will find. And in particular, if we can find evidence for this shadow, um, then this will be direct evidence for the existence of an Event Horizon and black holes in the universe. So I think this is a... This would be a significant step up from measuring masses of things and saying it has to be a black hole because it can't be anything else. Um, but whether or not this is right, um, we'll find out in the next few years as this Event Horizon Telescope gets, uh, gets even better. OK, so just to summarize what I've said, um, <clears throat> physicists starting in the 18th century and, and more accurately in the early 20th century said that black holes could exist. Um, and, this is, uh, and this is a really incredible prediction. And they're actually the simplest objects we know of um, in the universe. And then what's probably, what's just as or more amazing is that astronomers now find the black holes probably do exist, lots of them. Um, a big black hole in the center of every galaxy and lots of little black holes um, spread throughout all galaxies. And, and the other incredible thing about black holes is that although they're dark, they emit no light, um, they're actually power the most energetic and I would argue the most spectacular phenomena that we see in the universe. Um, and these are these radio galaxies or, or active galactic nuclei, as they're called. They're black holes that can out in the center of galaxies that outshine the entire galaxy. Uh, and, and we see these black holes in a couple of ways. So we see them from the light produced by infalling gas through the event horizon and also by their gravitational pull. So thank you very much. Uh, physicists, maybe, but not, not engineers or something. I mean, there's no, 
right, technological specs for this. That, maybe there are, there probably are actually. But there are a lot of sort of uh, physics calculations or maybe thought experiments or things like that of, yeah, how you could extract energy. Um, and, and a lot of these are actually relevant for, for things like these jets of energy that shoot out or something like that of black holes. These, these really, the, one of the leading theories for how this works is tapping into the energy of the black hole, extracting the spin energy um, in this jet. So not practical for our purposes, but um, yeah, very cool nonetheless. Uh, yeah. You said some of them don't spin. Well, we don't know really much about black holes and how they do or do not spin. They they can have a range of a range of spins, but um, or yeah, or or having uh, spinning in alignment within falling gas, or the opposite, or yeah, at an angle. Or, show the black holes looks like a spinning disc, but actually it's a big ball, isn't it? So everything falls in at 360 degrees in all directions. Well, so that depends less on the black hole than what the gas itself is doing. So the reason that we think that oftentimes, at least, gas that falls in forms a disc is just that stuff is normally falling in from very far away, from right, event horizons are tiny compared to, say, the size of a binary with a black hole and a star, or, or the size of the galaxy where stuff would be falling into the black hole. So it's very unlikely that things will be aimed straight at it so that it could fall in 360 degrees. So what likely happens is that the gas starts to orbit. And when it starts to orbit, then it's very possible for it to collapse down into this disk. So the disk has much less to do with the black hole's own structure or things like that, and much more to do with just how gas falls from very far away to very down close. Yeah, so to my knowledge, there hasn't been any of this, although I'm also not sure if we would have expected to detect any of these things. So I know there are at least a couple of, there are at least a couple of scenarios, and this is really pushing my knowledge of it, um, that where uh, you could expect to observe a signature of, of black holes evaporating, sort of primordial black holes. But I don't, I'm not familiar with really how much we would have expected to see this or when we would expect to see it. I, I assume that estimates for what this signal would be can probably vary quite a bit, right? depending on what black holes form. So these would be primordial black holes or black holes that would be very small that would be formed in the Big Bang and that could now be evaporating. So black holes, the theory of black hole evaporation is that the um, time that it takes to evaporate is much, much faster if you're, if you're a small black hole. So these ones that I've talked about are not evaporating in any sort of universe time. Yeah, so this um, so there's a theory that uh, black holes can lose can lose mass over time, um, and that's and that's that. Uh, yeah, um, and so yeah, I don't I'm not going to get okay. into it, but yes, that you can lose mass over time, and that it's much faster for smaller things. And, and yeah, I mean, really be destroyed. Like, you can really lose the whole black hole. Yep. Uh, yeah. in, in, the, uh, in the model, was the UFC model where the stars were uh, uh, kind of orbits which would show a pattern at the center of a continuum and event horizon uh, uh, as evidence of a black hole? Uh, the stars, uh, is that to say that the stars can't be absorbed? Um, so those stars, so the, actually there's, there's that little star at the middle of this picture, um, but those stars are actually quite far from the event horizon. Too far away for the gravity to become. That's right. Yeah, so this, so I think this, uh, this yellow one here comes quite close, but it really comes within maybe a thousand times the size of the event horizon or something. So it would, you can calculate where a star would be torn apart if you could get to, um, and it's much smaller, it's like, I don't know, something like 10 to 100 times the size. So we'd have to get much closer but it can't in. Yeah, definitely. There's actually a observational evidence that people are claiming now that they're seeing tar stars being torn apart by big black holes or medium-sized black holes in other galaxies. Um, and this is a study of, a very intense study of active research.
called Tidal Disruption, if you wanted to read about it. Um, over there. So, assuming that black hole is absorbing energy as the orbit is rotating, uh, because if it becomes stable, it starts moving around, is that an accurate assumption? I, I would say so, sure. Yeah, I think so. I don't think there's any reason to assume that a spin of zero, the, the real, so the, the interesting effects like that flattening in that shadow or other cool things that happen in spinning black holes really don't start to happen until you get to very fast spins. So the issue is really, is it, yeah, so the issue is really is the spin small compared to uh, things rotating, well, compared to the maximum before that the black hole can possibly do, is it sort of 90% of what it can possibly do, or is it maybe 20%? That kind of spans the whole range. Like 20% isn't a very interesting spin, basically, if that makes sense. Right, depending on the material that it, so yeah, so things that get, that go into the black hole have a certain angular momentum, and those add to the spin, right? They have their own, basically, spin in some sense, and that adds to the spin, of, or subtracts from the spin of the black hole. Um, and you can, so you can change the spin of the black hole by uh, growing its mass by a factor of two or so. We'll change the spin to align with the stuff that's currently falling into it. So yes, it's very dynamic. It's, that's another interesting question is that maybe if you could measure spins of black holes uh, in, in the centers of galaxies, maybe that would tell you something about how they grow. Because right then you could say, like, do they always, are they maximally spinning? Do they always, uh, accretion is the word for this right swallowing step. Do they always accrete in the same direction? Or do they accrete kind of random stuff from all over the place, in which case maybe they're spinning very slowly? Yeah, good question. Yeah. I think maybe this oh. one last question. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Talk a bit. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you just calculate what will happen to it uh, in general relativity, then at some point it'll be torn apart um, by what are called tidal forces, but basically the difference in the gravitational force, uh, direction and strength between the different parts of the probe, say. And when that happens depends on sort of the mass of the black hole, because that's kind of how big the region inside the event horizon is, right? How, and so that's kind of how big that is compared to the size of the probe or something would tell you exactly where. So for small black holes, macroscopic type things would get torn apart well before they made it in the event horizon, but for bigger black holes, you can, uh, you, like a person can make it through, or a probe could make it through the event horizon. But at some point, we just think in some fairly short amount of time, it'll just get torn apart and then enter the, cross the singularity, and then we don't really know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, torn down to smallest possible pieces eventually. I mean, becomes anyone's guess as you get right pretty small there. <laughs> as you get close to this singularity, then we, we really don't have the physics to describe it. Okay, Did we? <laughs> All right. Well, will the whole universe eventually become one giant black hole and nothing else? <laughs> uh, well, it kind of depends what happens to the universe. What we currently think happens to the universe is kind of the opposite bleak scenario. Um, where instead everything just keeps accelerating further and further apart, um, and eventually then you won't be able to see much at all. So, you black holes disappear then? Uh, no, no. So, objects that are bound on their own will still be, so a black hole will still be a black hole, a star will still be a star. Just the empty spaces between these objects will become larger and larger until you can't see nearby objects anymore. Expansion. Yeah, this is, this is this accelerating universe business that as far as we know right now, the acceleration of the universe is consistent with this end state where instead of going out to some radius and then crunching back down, the universe will instead just keep expanding forever. <laughs>